Hello reviewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about fiber laser. So let's dive deep into it. So the world needs it, meaning if tomorrow you can come to someone and it's like, bro, I got a fiber laser that is this powerful, people are like, shut up, take money. Flat out, world needs laser. If you can make a laser that is, let's say, 1 megawatt of output or 10 megawatts of output, people will like, shut up, take money. So reality is our world runs on laser. Like telecommunication, that's the whole reason internet exists, lasers. Uh, industrial processes, like we are getting really good at mass production. How the heck do you think that happens? Lasers, not only for cutting, but also for welding. We are actually good at it now. So telecommunication industry and defense industry is just orgasming over it simply because this is the easiest way to take care of cheap threats, for example, drones. You really do not want to use a Patriot missile to uh, poof a DJI drone. That would be very insulting to Patriot missile. So uh, we have to use lasers. And again, those weather balloons, lasers. So although they call it with a different name, they call it directed energy weapon. That's like hululu. It's like, dude, it's just laser. Just call it laser. And again, NASA is also trying to have laser communication from Mars to Earth. So higher bandwidth communication can be done in real time. So that's there. And we need a lot of power, flat out. Like at this point in time, if you can make something that is very powerful and very efficient, people are like, shut up, take money. So need is there. Do not even worry about it. Like who needs it? It's like you make it, they will come running. So we start with pumping. So you start with laser diode. Now this would be like odd. It's like, hey, if I already have laser, why don't I use the laser? Well, uh, there are certain uh, issues with this. So... You take laser diode like this, or uh, a pack of them. Now, laser diodes are very efficient, meaning the semiconductor, they are basically more or less fancy LEDs. So they're very efficient. That's the good part. You can easily achieve 50% if they're cooled properly. And I cooling does not mean like, you know, liquid nitrogen cooling. Cooling simply means basically cool enough as like operating temperature. So generally they are water cooled and they have a peltier to maintain their temperature to precise level. Like let's say 24 degrees Celsius, depending on the uh, module, they will say like this temperature is required. So they are very efficient. 50% efficiency is easily to achieve and more than that can be also achieved but they have very poor optical quality, meaning the oomph that comes out of it and the circular nature of it, that's not very good. So that's the issue. On top of that, they do not scale well, meaning if you try to actually make a uh, this system, which is like a few hundred kilowatts, yeah, good luck with that. It's generally not gonna work. So the biggest I have seen that is like actually commonly industrially available is used generally in cinema projectors. IMAX has like uh, lasers, like blue laser, green laser, and red laser. Those are very powerful lasers, but most of the time, it literally looks like somebody has, uh, you know, married way too many diodes together. So it does have poor optical quality and does not scale up to kilowatt. Meaning if you go to someone, it's like, hey, I want one kilowatt uh, diode laser. They'll be like, yeah, uh, unless military technology has it, we do not have it. So that's a very serious issue. And quality, again, if you have poor quality laser, it's not that useful. So that's the reality of it. So we use multiple of them basically this is one of them and you use multiple of them like a 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 you can use more and by, by the way this is a small one some ones uh, large ones have many more than that and this each of them are also very powerful they could go as low as like 1 watt power to as high as like 20 watt or 50 watt or even 100 watts of power each one of them so how the heck they work? Well, they are basically upgraded LED. So you take uh, one semiconductor material, you dope them with N-type and P-type on both sides. You create a band gap. Now what you do is put a voltage in there. So electrons jumps now. Electron goes to the basically over side, uh, electron that has too much electrons, they dumped into the N side, but it's there is an unbalance there. So unbalance has to be corrected. Basically it has to dump energy to become balanced again. So it releases a photon. Now photons are released, okay, that's LED. Now LEDs are monochromatic, this also would be monochromatic. To make sure that you have stimulated emission of radiation, you basically make sure this cavity is polished on one side to 100%, basically it's 100% mirror. Other side, the front side would be almost 95% uh, reflective. Now that forces photons to bounce back and forth. That forces every other emission to happen on almost same wavelength. Now how do you make sure the output is very collimated beam? 
well the length basically this side this axis you have to make sure it's multiple of the wavelength so whatever red so you take the red wavelength multiply it with a three i think so that's how you decide this so then you manufacture your laser diode and this works now problem with this is i specified the quality is not very good i have linked a video down below somebody firing a laser in a microscope it looks really amazing you should check it out so it has two axes one is fast axis basically if you ever took any laser diode i have ordered one it did not arrived yet if you take any laser diode and if you magnify it through a magnifying glass you'll always find it's not circular it's oval so how the heck it's oval it's oval because of this design so fundamentally it has a one axis where photons are going lol another axis not going as lol so it's always oval so we generally use a lens to collimate it better and then you get the output so same thing is happening here you see this sort of uh, yellow chip modules and a uh, lot of them combined their power now, how the heck do you combine laser power? This is where biconical couplers come to uh, existence. They are basically a very interesting way to bond fibers so all the power can go in. And that's why it has to be laser. You cannot just dump power. It will create too much heating. It has to be very efficient, very smooth. Uh, smooth as in like wavelength wise. It cannot have too much noise. So it goes there. So now you can compile as much as you want. And be mindful, this is the limiting factor. So if you have this that is only giving you, let's say, 100 watts of laser output, the fiber laser output would be less than 100. You will never exceed 100% efficiency. So fundamentally, you dump 100 here, you only get, let's say, 80 out there. So if you want kilowatts of laser out there, you have to have multiple stages of them and combining using uh, basically biconical couplers or use very large diodes nowadays some large diodes are easily available like 100 watt is like you can just buy go to somewhere it's like 100 watt laser here shut up and take money so this is the pump stage this is how you start and compile all the lasers into a fiber and now the fiber has a source that pump source is ready you're good to go then we dump into gain medium once you pump it you have to dump it so this is where power is added and emission happens so emission simply means if you uh, put energy into something like either by electricity or by other photons it's generally not comfortable there it's like Haha, i'm not comfortable basically you dumped energy electron is hot it's like not comfortable in the orbital it goes down to lower orbiter and dumps a photon photon is what energy packet it dumps it now this dumping is kind of controlled you know what you're gonna get out of it so selecting let's say you selected e e iberium uh, that will take input input would be 980 nanometer it will dump out 1550 nanometer or you can do ytterbium and that would absorb 976 uh, nanometer and it will dump uh, 1030 nanometer so depending on doping you can figure out the output so this is where you are pumping the energy all the hundreds of uh, basically kilowatts if you want to do that far powerful you dump it here and this is where it changes so you could have input of 976 or 980 and it will go into deep infrared benefit of infrared generally is very good for cutting metals so you dump your energy basically you dump here and emission happens now it's not stimulated emission but it's just emission basically it's, at this point it's just a led so different doping depending on your nanometer requirement now how the heck you do that dumping part how the heck photons of one laser that you have already used is creating another emission you have to look into the fiber now fiber has two coatings so input is happening from a sloppy laser diodes and then it's going in the outside grating it's bouncing back basically outside cladding is bouncing back so every time a photon is bouncing back and forward because of total internal reflection it must cross the core every time is going through the core there is a good chance it will hit a atom in the core and do this thing stimulated emission it will do that like so you dump energy into it it releases and because it's already happening in the fiber it's already by design single mode so it will directly follow the fiber and you will have the wavelength that you have selected so the core part is the doped part generally you take quartz crystal and we dope it with whatever you need to to get whatever you need it's very efficient but it still needs cooling because you are dumping again uh, hundreds of kilowatts of energy so you do need to cool it and that's why you will always see all these fiber are uh, rotated around generally a very big metal block and some of the very high powerful lasers on they generally uh, round round it route on a water cooled metal plate like serious amount of cooling has to be done and be mindful the more power you want to add the more cooling it will require generally people want to make it as long as possible so some of them big powerful lasers could easily be a few kilometers not joking or exaggerating yes many of them do go to that level but thankfully it's the fiber is very thin so you can just keep spooling it up and you can easily give cooling also
So it's very efficient but does require cooling and the longer the better it becomes in terms of efficiency and in terms of coupling efficiency. So thermal load actually goes down the longer the fiber you can afford the better it will be. So that's how we do and the single board multi mode you will hear that multi mode simply means the core is way too thick and single board means very thin and single mode only allows one uh, entry access so to say so and why does it matter in like uh, com telecommunication if you have photons that are entering from multiple angle the reflections would be completely different so timing signal would be messed up so some pulse will come too early some pulse will come too late so clarity of signal on the other end would be messed up so that's why we prefer single mode in laser we prefer single mode it allows for much more beam quality so this is where we dump all the laser diode dumps the energy into the gain medium gain medium is the fiber itself and that's why we call it fiber laser so you dump the energy you have the doping ions you are getting the output that you precisely selected but you have to cool it and that's why like that spool whenever you see giant spool around a metal body is the cooling part of it now that only gives you half of the laser. You still need a cavity. You need the bounce and bounce and back and forth because spontaneous emission, you dump energy, it dumps as a photon. That's the easy part. We've done it. LED does this. But if you need laser output, you need stimul stimulated emission, meaning all other atoms also have to dump energy in the same way. How do you do that? This is a uh, ironic of uh, elements in our periodic table that they like to do that anyway. Like they, they just like it. If you give them exactly the right photon it will like okay i'm going to give you this exact photon same wavelength same phase also it's like it is just a law of physics so it's like you give them like a red in one uh, let's say clockwise polarization it will give you red in clockwise polarization so it does that so this is the stimulation level but you need cavity for it you need a lot of photon bouncing back and forth back and forth if you do not have that back and forth well it's not gonna work so Bragg gratings are used. Now what is Bragg grating? It's uh, the most way, efficient way of making a mirror. So if you ever wondered how the heck people reflect ultraviolet in those uh, UV lithography machines, Bragg grating. So it's basically refraction, internal refraction, refraction, internal reflection. It's like a very convoluted system but it does allow almost 100% reflection. And yes, it's like it touches 100%. That's how good it will be like 99.995, something like that. It's very efficient. So at the ends of fiber, at the end of pump uh, fiber, both ends, we put Bragg grating and it's very efficient at selecting nanometer. Meaning you can even have a sloppy laser that is like, you know, emitting some uh, output that is not very sharp. The Bragg grating would be like, I got this fan. Meaning if you send red laser, it's like, I got you, I will reflect it. If you send blue laser, it's like, it won't even notice it, it just go through. It's very precise, like it's like I decide what goes, what does not go, it's very precise. And it is very temperature sensitive. Now, why the heck it's temperature sensitive? Because it's happening in the core and it's are nanometers apart. If you heat the fiber, the gap expands and contracts. So fundamentally, these things also require cooling. Be mindful, it will not look like you cannot see them with your open eyes. Fiber inside the core, it has that grating. So it's very tiny thing. So they are very temperature sensitive, but they do allow you to have 100% reflection. So this allows light to bounce back and forth as long as it needs to, to achieve the stimulated emission, basically cascade of photon release. It can keep doing that. So one side would be basically the side where you are entering uh, the cavity, basically which side you are pumping, it would be 100% reflective. The other side, basically the output side would be 95, depending on the design, it would be 95% efficient. So it will let some output and that would be your laser output. So one side is 100%, another side would have some percentage that will let it out and it controls the every aspect of fiber laser. This is how you control which wavelength comes out, what is the quality of it and again if you mess this part up the color changes and again hope color changes because generally it, uh, if it's changing it generally is a very good chance you're gonna fry your fiber and if you ever wondered like why the heck laser fiber requires such a very precise cooling this is the reason and you can see like you can dump input of a let's say white light source from sun it will re reflect one and reflect another it's like very precise it's like and you can select it which wavelength so this is how we create cavity so we dumped energy we gained it up we reflected it again and again then we had this three stages so let's look at the complete picture so it makes better sense so you start with pumping laser diodes this is basically you consume electricity you create laser diodes and you get energy into the internal cladding you can see that the fiber compared to normal uh, communication fiber is generally core cladding done here core cladding external cladding so you have two places so the 
inner cladding is the place where you are dumping the laser and the cross section basically when photons are cross crisscrossing it, it will cross the uh, doped core. The moment it crosses the doped core, there is a good chance it will interact with the atoms there, dump photon, random photons. That photon will travel through the fiber. It will, uh, if it helps other photons to basically join in the cascade, it will be awesome. But it will hit the end of it, bounce back and it will keep doing it until there is a sea of dumping. Basically, a lot of photons are dumping in the same way, then output will happen. So exactly like how you have in normal YAC laser, you have flash lamps and the flash lamp dumps their energy into the crystal, crystal gets pumped up and it has mirrors back and forth and those mirrors allow them to resonate properly and once you have that resonance, laser output. Awesome. So this is how we achieve that. Now here's the deal, what if you do not want that? This will give you what we call continuous laser. But generally continuous lasers are again, some projects shut up take money. Other times they're like, what if we can do temporal compression to it? For example, you take one kilowatt of energy. That's awesome. Let's say you took one kilowatt pulse in one second. That's not that much of energy. However, if you compress that one second to one nanosecond, now you're talking about some serious power. So what if you want to input 8 watt of laser power and you want 20 kilowatt of laser output, you can do the temporal compression. So question becomes, how do you do that? Well, you remove the Bragg grating and instead of Bragg grating, you dump what we call a seed laser. So you have basically the same thing. A doped fiber is there that is still the gain medium but instead of high reflection you have another input this input has the seed laser and the seed laser will keep turning on and off very quickly so it will be like your pump lasers are pumping it's acting like a capacitor and capacitor is dumping the energy the moment you have a input and be mindful that's exactly how optical fiber boosters work so uh, like because be mindful it has to work at light speed how do you work at light speed you do not you simply say i'm gonna charge this optical fiber and the signal that is coming that is on and off it's like on it gets boosted up it goes away or your off signal it does not do anything it does not trigger what we call avalanche so either you make a system that re uses a resonant cavity it keeps bouncing back and forth or you use cascade failure basically one pulse came and it's just like da -da 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 cascade happened so your avalanche mode gives you pulse power very high pulse power and we generally use that for etching but if you do brutal cutting like if you want to cut through let's say one inch thick steel uh, at that point generally people choose continuous power and what about the total system efficiency laser diodes can be very efficient but what about the total system efficiency many systems cross 50 percent plug power efficiency meaning plug to light how much let's say it would be a two kilowatt system the laser output will actually touch one kilowatt or even exceed one kilowatt specifically in cold places and in hot places like in india uh, all the energy savings kind of goes away with cooling but it's still very very efficient compared to uh, co2 lasers and any other laser system is like short uptake money so they're very efficient and if you cool, uh, cool them very well you can achieve like and you will understand how Raytheon figured out how to put a freaking 15 kilowatt anti-drone laser that's how you do that you just take all lot of small systems pump their power into pump combiner then diffraction grating allows you the lasers to keep uh, piling it up and then dump it although it they could also try that seed laser thing rather than having continuous because be mindful when I'm saying seed from our point of view it will look continuous laser it's like it could be uh, on and off kilohertz rate like 10 kilohertz 50 kilohertz that's continuously on from our point of view and anything that is getting hit by it yeah it's like bro it does not matter so this is the complete architecture you pump all the energy into the fiber fiber dopes uh, dumps all that energy into the core core gives it out and you have a cavity mechanism or cascade mechanism depending if you need seed lasers if you want pulse system use seed laser otherwise you use diffraction gratings so this was my presentation on fiber laser. Hopefully you have liked it, learn from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.